Hi everyone, how's it going? Uh, I'm Sam, and I'm going to be talking about Structure Maker on the MVP. Um, first of all, who am I? I am an iOS developer at the Bank of New Zealand. I live in Wellington, New Zealand, and we have a team of about 11 to 13 iOS developers. Um, I've been doing iOS dev since the early days, uh, since about 2009. I did a bunch of apps on the App Store before I left high school, and then meandered off to C Sharp .NET World during university, and then went back to work at a startup for about three years doing iOS and a lot of time on Ruby on Rails. AWS, EmberJS, and a bit of a sabbatical and some really well-tested frameworks and easy to structure frameworks, um, which kind of inspired this talk today. Finally, this is a Twitter-friendly talk. You're welcome to take photos and mention me. Uh, go for it. Conference hashtag is hashtag devworld. So today I want to talk, talk about a story of evolution. Um, the iOS community has gone through some phases of evolution, and I'm going to want to frame it in the sense of my favorite game. So I really like Age of Empires, um, even though it's made by Microsoft. Um, but it's arguably my most favorite game. And in Age of Empires, we had this notion of ages. And they're loosely based on the, the Paleolithic ages uh, we know in history. But in Age of Empires 1, there was the Dark Age, the Tall Age, the Bronze Age, and then the Iron Age. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about the Dark Age first, the Dark Age of iOS programming. So this is like 2009-ish, um, and sort of lasted for a bit longer than we'd like. And the hallmark of this age was our favorite three letters in the iOS programming community, <sighs> MVC. Um, so the Apple introduced MVC to us uh, at, at this time, and if you're a Mac developer, you'd be using it before that. And MVC stood for Model View Controller. Um, it was a reasonably simple architecture that looks like this. Um, the idea was the controller would read from the model and put that on the view. The user would do something with the view, tap a button, type in some text, that would go back to the controller, the controller would update the model, which would then magically persist or do something. And so um, it's quite a simple, clean architecture, um, and it was allowing you to structure your code in a, in a reasonably sane way. And so for examples, uh, for the views, you'd have like collection views or table views. Um, on the controller, you'd have um, things like controlling and coordinating between uh, what's happening with the views and what's happening with getting to the next view. In the models, you'd have things like a customer object or a thing or just any sort of object you'd have, real world or otherwise. But then other things started to come up that we needed to do inside of iOS apps. We needed to do things like networking, caching, um, view data source and delegates. So we're like, oh, where do we put this? Um, so we're like, oh, fuck it, let's just put it in the controller. <laughs> um, it seems like a central place. It's not model code. It's not view code. So mm, what's left is the controller. So um, the controller started doing a lot, like a real lot. Um, it was the delegate for the table view, the, delegate, the data source for a table view. It did network calls. It parsed the results of those network calls into models, either via a dictionary or via a DTO. Um, it did sorting of, of arrays and manipulation of that data for display. Um, it accessed SQL or, or core data. Um, it did the sizing and estimation and self road index path stuff. Um, and it did so much more, um, pretty much everything you needed to do for your app that wasn't in the app delegate. Um, so we started to kind of give it the, the, the nickname of Massive View Controller, um, and that was fine. Like, who really cared, right? These were the early days of the App Store, um, and Apple didn't seem to care. It was almost their preferred way of telling us how to do it. And what was our motivation? It was the days of the gold rush. We were doing these apps as experiments. We were putting them out. We were making you know, zero to millions of dollars. I was kind of at the zero end. Um, <laughs> and like, it was the gold rush. Like, no one, no one really cared. So, you know, who, who, who cares? Like, the thing is, massive view controllers are the hidden shame of every iOS developer. Um, we've all done it, let's be honest. We all kind of enjoyed it at the time. But now I think we know better. Um, but we're not proud of it. It's like that time I watched Frozen. Um, <laughs> So what's the, what's the problem here? Like, controllers are essentially doing too much. Um, and then further to that, a controller, if it does all the work, it has no defined inputs and no defined outputs. It's sort of just this black box where it's like, go. And then there's, all of a sudden there's a view and it's been done. Um, and that means there's tons of side effects, right? Because it's accessing user defaults, or a disk, or the network, or something else. Um, and you don't really know what it's doing and why it's doing it. And it's kind of really hard to observe. And there was no real consequences of this program behavior. Going back to what I was saying before, it was a gold rush. We didn't care. Like, for all we know, Angry Birds was one big view controller. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't really matter. But then the gold rush was over. 
Um, and we wanted different things with our apps. We wanted to have longevity, maintainability. Apps sort of went from a company's marketing budget as an experiment through to the company's IT budget or like actual product. They started to affect our bottom lines. They started to be a strategical direction for a lot of businesses. And so this went from experiment to a product, a product that needed to live for a long time. Um, it needed to be testable, maintainable, it needed to keep up with OS updates, um, we needed to be able to use source control, not just edit everyone editing the one file, the one view controller, um, and we need to be able to release with confidence. We now have a lot of users and it's important. This app is now part of the, the business's reputation, it's one of their products, and, and damaging that could be potentially quite damaging for the company. So it was time, it's time to invent, uh, advance to the next age. The next age is the tool age. In the tool age, we start worrying about tooling, we start worrying about um, processes, practices, and architecture. And lastly, we start worrying about desirable code. What does good code look like? In brief, because it's a whole conference, <laughs> I believe, um, for the scope of this talk, it's single responsibility, essentially. Code um, in modules, classes, structs, whatever, it has a single, well-defined responsibility. It has clear inputs and clear outputs, um, it follows reasonable solid patterns, which is an acronym which is quite hard to describe, but essentially the S is single responsibility, um, and a bunch of other desirable things like the use of protocols and subclassing and composition inheritance and that sort of stuff. It should be unit testable. If it's a sensible small unit that has clear inputs and outputs, it should be unit testable. Um, and there's a lot of more things that make good code good code. So what's the solution? The solution is to thoughtfully architect your app. This is the big thing here. Clean, maintainable code comes from thoughtful app architecture. I'll say it again, clean, maintainable code comes from thoughtful app architecture. So what is thoughtful, what is good app architecture? It's the act of decomposing your, the functionality of your apps into single responsibility objects with clear inputs and clear outputs. It's not massive view controller, it's many small things. Doing their job, talking to each other, and being a good unit. So we have some possible solutions. Um, we have MVP, MVVM, Viper, and there's, there's so many more. Um, let's chat about just MVP today, but uh, Viper's on tomorrow at 2 p.m. by Thomas. I think there would also be a really interesting conversation and talk to go to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today, what are we going to talk about? We're talking about MVP. Um, but we're talking about kind of my version of MVP, which may not be the version of MVP you've seen. So it looks more like this. Um, it's a model of view controller, presenter, provider, view. Um, so I'm going to talk, show a little um, diagram, and it's a pretty rough diagram at this stage, and we'll keep coming back to this, and I'll, I'll talk about it more and more. So don't try to understand it in one piece. Um, yeah, I, I don't expect you to. But already you can see the view controller is not massive. It doesn't do much. It's kind of the same size as everything else, and that's quite deliberate in terms of the way I've designed this. Um, and the arrows describe um, the data flows. So the view talks to the view controller, the view controller talks to the presenter, the presenter talks to the provider, and the provider um, uses the model and um, the network or disk to produce the data back to it. So what you, what's not happening is the view is not talking to the provider, or the view controller is not talking to the disk. Before we just had the view controller doing all the stuff and the provider and the presenter wouldn't really be there. Um, and so we've kind of split these out into simple single responsibility objects. So let's go each, uh, through each one, one by one. So the view is a standard iOS view. We're talking about literally the view that the view controller has a reference to. It could be a collection view, table view, manually laid out views, whatever. Um, just, yeah, whatever your heart desires really, uh, as long as it's pragmatic and matches the design, obviously. Um, a view controller, we all know as love. Um, it controls a view, it acts as, in this uh, particular pattern, it acts as the data, so data source or delegate uh, for your table views or collection views. It doesn't have to, um, but it's, it's somewhat pragmatic to keep them in there. It has the job of manipulating views on the screen, right? It's like it always has. So it lays out and populates things, put the data um, in the labels and stuff like that, and it receives user actions, it does your IB actions and that sort of stuff. And so it's, it's really... Um, kind of a, a single responsibility thing, all it does is it controls the view, as it's always meant to be doing. Um, but for anything else, it talks to the presenter. So if it, as for the data it puts in the views, it's not its problem. It talks to the presenter, the presenter asks, um, gives it back. So what's the presenter? The presenter um, interacts with the data provider class, and it asks the provider for its data, and then the presenter, on a per screen basis, 
uh, will manipulate or transform that data that makes sense for that view. It may create a subset, it may do ordering, it may do filtering, um, and it doesn't really know about the view to the point where like UIKit's not even included in that particular class because it literally doesn't need to know about it. There's no reference to UIKit, it just imports foundation and that's about it. Um, so the view controller will uh, request the data and the presenter will go and get the data if it doesn't already have it um, from the provider and that will chain backwards and the presenter will manipulate it further and give it back to the, um, the view and say, hey view, it's time to, to set up now or it's time for you to refresh and re-request the data because I've got it now. So the provider is the interesting thing. The provider essentially abstracts um, the source of truth. So it may be, it may kind of create a create a CRUD update, a CRUD interface for, you know, talking to a RESTful API. Um, it may abstract away a database, or it could, you know, even read from user defaults because we all love storing full objects and user defaults. Um, but either way, it takes that data and it constructs the models, and it passes the models back to the presenter um, as a list of arrays, all that sort of stuff. Uh, sorry, a list of objects as an array. Um, and then finally, a model. We all know what a model is. It represents a real-world or non-real-world object uh, with properties, and it be, can be created um, via a DTO, a domain transfer object, um, or codable or a, a dictionary. Um, and it may have a failable in it as well. That's something to consider here, is that we, um, a server may, represent an, uh, may send you an object, and sometimes the server may break that contract. It's, it's obviously pretty bad if it does. Um, so your app may decide what to do with a nil object. It's failed to create from the server response. Um, so if it's you know, like your customer object, um, there's not much your app can do if the customer object or the user object's not working properly. Um, but if it's like a, a particular pro, uh, object on a small sub-feature, and that feature doesn't work anymore, that doesn't need to crash your whole app. You can just say this, this feature is unavailable right now and raise it um, internally. So a failable init is a really good pattern here to use um, that can be represented and handled by your presenter as in, as in what to do. So going back to the um, diagram again, um, once again, the view talks to the view controller, the view controller talks to the presenter, the presenter talks to the provider, and the provider uh, talks to the network and constructs models and passes them all the way back through again. So how does that communication actually work between these modules? Um, the way I like to do it, and yeah, the way I like to do it is this. So the view talks to the view controller via UIKit standard. So like data sources, delegates, whatever. You talk back to it by set this or set that. Um, the view controller then um, has a reference to the presenter, and it just calls methods on the presenter like any other object. The presenter talks to the provider in the same way. As it comes back, I personally prefer to use delegates. So the provider. Well, the presenter will set itself as the delegate for the provider, and the view controller will set itself as the delegate for the presenter. And it will, it will take its delegate and flick data back to it as, it as it requires. It doesn't really matter if you use a delegate or a block or a, um, even like a subclass or even just a reference to the class. What does matter is that we are absolutely, absolutely not having the view controller talk to the provider or the network or the models directly. Um, the point is we keep these things away from each other and we communicate in the same way. How you do it is up to you. It's, a, it's just a matter of argument. Um, so at this point, it might be confusing as to like what owns what, uh, how is this all constructed, um, so, and what's weak and what's strong. So view controllers are just kind of owned by the app delegate. So that's out of our root object for apps still. Um, and it owns the view. Um, and it, in my opinion, weakly references the subviews. Uh, although Apple said strongly lately, so I don't really know what that's about. Um, but the view controller basically constructs its presenter. The presenter then constructs its provider, and the provider constructs or accesses shared URL session or, or constructs a reference to the thing that references where the data is. Um, and then you have weak delegates all the way back. So kind of a standard sort of pattern uh, for this sort of stuff. But it means that um, you can do things like dependency injection later, which is, is pretty easy. Cool, so I'll take you through a slight uh, code walkthrough. Um, so I've got a small project here. Let's see if this builds. Can't see it because I put it on the wrong screen. Oh. And launching. So this is called MV Pokemon. Um, it hits a Pokemon API for a list of Pokemon when it launches. Let's try that again. Uh, 
Have I got the right? Huh? Similar, I reckon? Mm, fail. Anyway, it's not particularly important what it looks like. It's a list of Pokemon names. Um, I'll come back to that later. Uh, cool, so we have the Pokemon controller here. What is it? Um, it holds a table view, as you'd expect. Um, I have a UI alert view controller for a loading spinner, because I couldn't be bothered bringing in progress HUD. Um, and a view will appear, it asks its presenter to fetch the Pokemon list. So, pretty standard. Say, hey presenter, I want my data now. Um, so let's jump into that. So in my presenter, I go to the fetch Pokemon list. Um, there's some DI stuff here happening, and I'll, I'll come back to that later. Essentially, it asks for its provider, hey, get the Pokemon list, which is the list of Pokemon. Um, also in here, the controller is, um, we have an extension on the controller here just for neatening up the components, um, which conforms to the table view delegate and data source, and the, the usual stuff, did select row, uh, self row index path. So at this point, it's also asking the presenter for the data. So the presenter's are going, hey, hey presenter, um, I would like the Pokemon at this index path, and then I'm going to capitalize it to put a capital on the front. Same thing with number of sections, same thing with number of Pokemon. So the presenter has a notion of sectioned data, but it doesn't have a notion of a UI table view. So you can, in theory, rewrite this controller with a collection view, and the presenter would not have to change like, at all. The thing is, in MVP, is that each of these components are individually substitutable, um, and, that, and that really hints at a really good design, because if, a, if you kind of leak that abstraction into different components, your, your design starts to kind of break down. So back in the presenter, um, this is sort of how this is implemented. We have a list. Um, Pokemon list. So I am, as the presenter, I'm the delegate for the provider. And the provider says, has uh, four methods on it, did begin fetching, did uh, finish fetching, did successfully uh, fetch Pokemon list, and it gives you a list, and it did fail to fetch, gives you an error. Um, and then we, in turn, have a protocol at the top that the view conforms to, and this says, hey view, I want you to begin loading now, I want you to end loading, I want you to show an error, or I want you to refresh the view. This could also be set view with properties, um, or set view with list, or, or something like that. Up to you, doesn't really matter. The thing is, as the presenter, I know that a, an asynchronous task is going to kick off, so I should tell the view that the view should start to represent that to the user. So begin loading is a good way to put up a spinner, or a pull to refresh, or anything you like. Um, show error, hey, there's something went wrong, um, and then the controller can, can look at that error message and, and do something with it. The presenter could also codify logic to handle certain types of error, um, certain types of errors uh, more gracefully than others. Does that make sense so far? Cool, lots of nodding. Um, so jumping into the provider now, this shouldn't surprise anyone. Um, so once again, we have this uh, delegate uh, declared here. I keep saying delegate because I'm an Objective-C person. Um, uh, protocol, <laughs> which you know, defines uh, how to get the data and, and how to fetch it back. Um, and then we have these, these models, which are stored inside here for arbitrary reasons. And they also conform to Codable to make the parsing simpler. So we have a Pokemon list result. Um, the API looks like it has a count, a previous, and a next and result, uh, result and next. And result is an, an array of this Pokemon index. So it has a name and a details URL to get more details about the Pokemon. The details URL I've I've written coding keys uh, to pull out the URL, just so I can give it a better name. Does that all make sense? Have you all seen Codable before? It's pretty neat. I definitely recommend looking into it. Um, it blew my mind when I wrote this code. I was like, oh, you can actually nest Codable things. Um, so down here, all I go is just to code Pokemon list, pass in the class name, and then I've got a list of Pokemons, which is pretty cool. Um, so in here, get Pokemon list, get the del delegate. Um, if you don't have a delegate return, there's no point doing the call if you don't have a delegate to tell them about the fun things you've found. Um, Lovely hard-coded string there. Um, so uh, as soon as it comes back, we call did finish. Um, here, before we kick off, we call did begin. Um, and then if there's an error, we go fail with the error. If there's an error decoding the data, we can fail with an error. Otherwise, the happy path is we successfully have the data. So that's gone to your URL session. This could be um, LMFI. This could be you know core data. could be anything you want where the data is. That's the source of truth. So going back down, um, this comes out, the presenter. And then we hold this list uh, just in memory here. And then so when I then I then tell the view, um, OK, it's time to refresh. So I can jump into that, just to find in here. Um, and inside of refresh view, 
Uh, have I got it here? No, I don't. I'm in the wrong place. Control it. So inside a refresh view, I basically just ask the table view to reload. We all know what that does. It goes and calls the delegate methods again, by which time um, the number of Pokemon is there, because we can just count the, n the number of Pokemon on the list. And the Pokemon name for the index path is there, because we can just jump in and grab it out of the array, out of the list. If the list isn't there, it doesn't do anything. So it turns optionals. It's up to the controller to handle those optionals. Um, so that makes sense. So that all makes sense, right? The data goes in, and it goes back out again. This is your classic putting JSON on a screen, which is like iOS development 101. <laughs> that's kind of what we do a lot of the time. So that's um, that with the code. Uh, let's see if I can run this again. I don't know what happened before. I'm going to kill the simulator and try to launch it from scratch. Waiting for the iPhone 8 to start. <coughs> Looks like Xcode's having a bit of a mare, so I'm going to come back to that later. Cool. Um, back to slides. So that was a code walkthrough, and that's where I find a lot of MVP or architecture talks stop. Um, but let's talk about the fun stuff, which is unit testing. So what good is an architecture if you can't actually unit test and get those benefits of unit testing in the long run? So let's talk about the units here. I've put big red circles around what I believe are the units. Um, the big unit is the presenter. Now, we talked about clear inputs and outputs, and those are also circled, the method call and the delegate going in and going out. Um, in my, my version of MVP, I don't bother really testing the view controller or the view. I leave that to UI testing or manual testing. Um, although, after going to jo uh, Joe's workshop on Sunday, I think you can do it with a high-level um, test as well um, as an alternative, which I, I'm keen to explore more after the conference. Um, once again, the provider is another really easy unit to test. It has a clear um, input and clear output and, and limited side effects. So now with this architecture, we have these things. We have clear inputs, clear outputs, and clear side effects, which is only the provider. So we just need to stub that so it stops going to the network. And all these things have a single responsibility. The presenter just takes data from a provider and manipulates it for display. And my provider didn't do anything. It just passed it through. But you can imagine it could do filtering of Pokemon or, or anything you want. Um, they have a single responsibility. I'm the provider. I just hit the network, and I give out the data. I don't manipulate it. I don't uh, do anything fancy with it, and that sort of stuff. So then there's me, um, and I get really excited about this stuff. Talking earlier, I had that sabbatical in um, Ruby on Rails land. In Ruby on Rails land, everything's very easy to test because they are in a further age than us, I would, I would argue, and they sort of have um, all the better tools and that sort of stuff. So what does a, a good test look like? Um, here's anatomy of a test. In my opinion, I like to use the setup run verify. Some people like to use given uh, when then. I think, Joe, you had something different on Sunday. It was like arrange, arrange act, and assert. assert. Yeah. Um, same idea. Do your setup up front, make it clear as to what's set up and what's running, and then do the running code, and then make you clear what's um, your assertions. So in terms of a um, like the presenter, I would, in the setup, I'd construct the presenter. I would give it any data it needs, um, and then I would make the method call on it as the act or the, uh, the run, and then I would use a mock delegate. I'll set the mock delegate on it in the setup phase, and then I would record stuff um, as that delegate gets called, and then I would assert that those recordings took place. So what do the tests look like for this? Jumping back out of Keynote now, um, let's try Xcode again. Cool, we all see that? Awesome. So, um, let's see if that runs this time. I'll be interested to see if it runs. In the meantime, um, let's look at the presenter tests. So, Titch, uh, here's a pretty good one. So, um, the test fetch Pokemon list no error. So, set up first, run, verify. So, provider, I just create an instance of a the mock provider. The mock provider is... Um, uh, where did I put it? Uh, it's probably down the bottom here. Mock provider here. So I've subclassed the provider, and I've put in some Pokemon, and then when you call, I've overridden... Um, oh, hello. I can now show you the app. It's worth the wait. It's a list <laughs> of Pokemon. And the scrolling's a bit buggered on the uh, simulator. But 
Yeah, so it's a list of Pokemon in order, all 947 of them. Um, yeah. So, I can code. <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> Ten years, can't get the similar work. Um, so, yeah, as I say, uh, I... Oops, I've jumped out the wrong file now. So I overrode this get Pokemon list, and I'm just calling the delegate manually, um, and then I had this um, error flag here, which I can set uh, in my test setup phase. And so if I've set the error, it'll call the error one with the error I give it. And if it's um, the successful phase, it'll just give you back the list of pre-canned list I've made. So going back up to here, um, no error. So as the presenter, the view is the mock view, and I'll come back to it in a second. Um, and I'm passing in the provider, and I'm doing dependency injection here. So dependency injections are another whole talk, um, but the way I've done it is just to pass in a alternate provider as a default parameter that's nil usually, and it use, if it's there, it'll use this instead. Um, it's a bit gross, but you can do it in the init method, or you can do it as a var on the thing. Um, at, at BNZ, we use a, a feature which we register stuff at runtime, and it, it looks up the how to create an instance at runtime. There's a few open source things that do that. Um, up to you. The idea is that you provide an alternate implementation during your tests, and you try not to ruin your production code too much while you do it. Um, so the mock view, uh, good question. So we're in the presenter test. What does the mock view do? So the mock view is just a view that um, <coughs> conforms to the protocol Pokemon presenter view. You could also have done a subclass of view if you weren't using a protocol. Up to you. The fact is you want to some, have some sort of output you can collect. And then I've created a thing called a recorder. So a recorder here, um, once again, I use a more sophisticated one at my day job, but this is a really simple one that just has a method <coughs> and it makes a list of method calls and it puts on uh, the method name and arguments to it. So you can assert that this method was called with these arguments. This could do things like um, asserting that it only happened once or that this thing didn't happen, but this is just a basic one to, to prove the idea of you can record this and then say so in your verify stage, you can make, once we're in, um, so we've we set up the mock view, we have the mock provider, oh sorry, wrong one, um, and we've used that here, we've got the mock view set up, so now we can run it, fetch Pokemon list, and then we can start to verify it. And since this is all mocked, it's all beautifully synchronous, which is good, um, saves you doing the wait stuff, and I want to assert that begin loading was called with the argument loading, which was the text, then I want to assert that end loading was called with no arguments, and then I want to assert that refresh view was called on the view. Does that make sense? So I've mocked the provider, so that the bit it talks back to is mocked, gives you back canned data. And I've mocked the view because I don't care about it, I just want to know that something gets hit with the output. And then I've run the thing, and now I'm asserting that the, um, the methods were called, um, and that sort of stuff. Down here there's an error. And so a lot of the tests look the same as this, and they're, they're quite easy to do. Um, I'm just going to check the time. Cool. Um, and so obviously things like test Pokemon mo uh, name before load has to be nil. Uh, after load, um, it becomes a name and that sort of stuff. Uh, so test one, test two, and I can do all that sort of stuff. So I have full control of the thing it's talking to, full control of the thing it's talking um, or getting the data from and what it's talking to, and I can write really simple tests that are really easy to read. And at work and in, in, in my personal projects, I like to comment with setup run verify, and it makes it really obvious as to what's just setup code and what's just run code and what's just verify code. It's not um, hard to add, and it, it adds great readability. The provider tests look the same, essentially. We have a mock um, URL session, and we, have a mock, and we have this mock delegate, which is a mock Pokemon provider delegate. We run it, and then we assert things were called. We were asserting that did beginner fetching was called, did finish fetching, did successfully fetch, and did fail to fetch was not called. Uh, assert false here. Um, John Sundell has a great way of how you do this, so I've pinched his stuff for this um, code base. And so this basically just lets you put data and hand it back. Pretty straightforward mocking um, solution. Once again, this, this provider, the delegate here, the mock delegate, uses the recorder class and records the stuff. Um, in terms of the can JSON this turns to, I have it in here, um, and then I have a little util here which gets it from a um, file and brings it into the program. So you can have a little um, JSON here, and that can be generated from your Swagger docs of your server or anything like that. You can automate the crap out of that to make sure you have valid JSON inside your project to be used. And you can share that with your Android um, team as well, because same endpoint, more than likely. So those are the tests. Um, a word on tests. Um, the most important thing about tests, if you're finding your tests hard to write, review your code. Um, so 
if you're finding them hard to write, those were quite easy to write because I had clear inputs, clear outputs, um, and no side effects. And so if you're watching Joe's talk on Sunday morning, his tests were very hard to write. You had providers and helpers everywhere because your code was a mess. You had, to, you had your controller and it was going out to all these things and you had to like stop each thing as it was trying to break out of its, uh, do its side effects. And then it was just like quite hard to do. And as soon as you are taking more than five lines to write a test, you're like, oh, is this, is this a sensible unit? Um, so yeah, if you're finding your tests hard to write, review, review your code um, and review your architecture. So that's MVP. What is it? It's logical units of work. It has clear inputs, clear outputs, and nice side effects. I've said that phrase like 10 times during this talk because I want it to stick, sink in. Um, and it's possible to 100% unit test uh, the UI. So if you're looking carefully in the sidebar of that demo, it was all um, not red. I'd, I'd covered all the um, code parts. There were a few guards I didn't bother testing, but it was largely 100% uh, unit tested, probably about 98%. It's possible to get 100%, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, it uses interfaces and delegates for communication in uh, my MVP. MVP is still an option for you to structure your code, um, and it's a lightweight architecture that's new to those who are, for, for those who are new to architectures. There are more complex architectures, um, but this is a really good one to start thinking about architecting your code outside of the controller. <laughs> uh, what MVP is not? It's not the only way to do this. Um, please look at your um, code base, uh, your team, the experience of that team, and decide. With the BNZ app in New Zealand, we have typically quite short flows. So if you go to the menu, then go to create a payment or do a payment, it's usually one or two screens deep. We don't have long listing processes that you might have in an auction app. We don't have long forms or wizards. Um, so things like coordinators or vipers doesn't really work for us because it would be overkill, essentially. We have the use of coordinators when we're doing our login flow for the first time, which includes anti-fraud measures and stuff like that. So that's a series of maybe 10 to 15 screens that needs more thoughtful architecture. An MVP is not the end of all bugs. Uh, you'll still get bugs. You can still write tests that don't show your um, bugs properly. It's possible to get 100% code coverage and still have missed error cases. Um, and it's not really noticeable, noticeable to your users. Um, I'm sure you wouldn't know by looking at an app what sort of architecture it is. But it is noticeable to them in five years' time, where you're actually able to modify this code with ease. And it has a shelf life that's much longer than a big, massive view controller. So what's next um, for iOS architectures? Well, Zach's kindly provided me this website to show you all, which I think is hilarious. So this is an iOS architecture generator. So if you're struggling with MVP, you can just click this button, and it'll generate a new architecture for you. <laughs> so this is made by uh, Guillermo Rambo. Um, he's quite a well-known iOS uh, engineer. Um, and so you can just come here and do that. Uh, you can't download a sample project to get started just yet, but I'm sure there's a pull request in your head for that. Please don't do that, second place. Um, so uh, next up is the Bronze Age. Um, once again, Thomas is having a talk tomorrow. I recommend going. I think it'll be really interesting. But what's this really all about? Like MVP, cool, you've talked about one thing, but then you've kind of like sold it short at the end. What's this really all about? Um, architectural patterns are about expressing yourself in logical units that are individually replaceable, expandable, and testable and interoperable. That's it. The, um, I'll say it again. In architectural patterns are about expressing yourself in logical units that are individually replaceable, expandable, testable, and interoperable. These are just simple, single responsibility objects that have clear inputs, and guess what? Clear outputs. Um, and so these better patterns, they lead to better code, they lead to better apps, they lead to better user experience, and they lead to better for business. Like, we're paid as engineers to make an asset for a company, and that asset is the code base, an app, or even a user experience, or even a, like going as far as to say a reputation or a service. At the end of the day, as engineers, we are doing a better job if we're making a better asset for the company. That's me. Um, I'm with sanjarman.co.nz. If you want to work at BNZ, check out Good With Pixels. We're hiring in New Zealand. Um, and more about Solid at that link. Thanks very much.